Welcome, everyone. So glad to see you today. My name is Brad Weinstein. I am one of the uh, co-authors of our upcoming book. And uh, just a little bit about myself. We're going to introduce all of us, then we're going to get started with our webinar. But I'm the uh, co-author of Hacking School Discipline. And I am really excited to invite you tonight because in my travels around the world and the country, we keep on talking about artificial intelligence. And I'm like, OK, why is how are we still relevant as humans in the future? And that's what I'm going to talk about in the book. Um, we're going to go over to Amanda. You can introduce yourself and then Dan's going to introduce himself. Hi, I'm Amanda Fox. Um, I am the author of the Canva Classroom. I've been an educator for 10 years and I am a uh, avid ed tech um, seeker of, of not just new things, but um, learning how to use them and starting with them on the peripheral education. Usually in after school programs, I work with a lot of students and folding them into our classroom instruction on a day to day basis. Um, I'm excited to be a co-author on the AI classroom. And um, my my specialty is more of integrating AI into our instructional design practices. So I'm going to talk a little bit about UDL later on. Dan. Hey, um, yeah, I'm having a really good start. I, I kicked myself out, um, so but I'm back. Um, I'm here. Um, it's, it's great to be with be with you all. Um, as you can probably tell from my accent, I am uh, coming to you from the UK. Um, so it's uh, it's just after midnight here. So um, Brad, Amanda, just just prod me if I fall asleep. Uh, and I, I really want to thank you. And Amanda came up with these graphics, and she's she's given me my hair back. It's, it's, <laughs> I feel like all, all my Christmases have come at once. Um, Dude, Mid Journey did that. I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> Miracles happen. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. I'm Dan Fitzpatrick. I am. I'm so excited to uh, to be co-authoring the AI Classroom book. Uh, my my job in the in the UK is I work for a group of colleges, and I lead digital strategy. And I write and I present and do do a lot of things on kind of future tech and, and, and everything AI at the moment. So really excited to share some ideas and, and explore the future of education with you. Well, we've got some um, people tuning in from uh, Texas, uh, the Philippines, uh, let's see, the UK, Canada, Australia, Brisbane, shout out. I, I know Jonathan Nalder is also watching. Um, more Texas, France, uh, Michigan, Kentucky, Kansas City. So awesome. Um, thank, thank you all for uh, joining us tonight. And um, we're excited to uh, kick off the show. Awesome. All right. So thinking about where we're going today. And uh, what we're going to do, we're going to set the tone and uh, tell you what's coming. We're going to talk about what it is in education. Like, what is this artificial thing all about? What does it mean? Um, what are the limits so far that we've found? But what are the benefits? What is it going to look like? How is it going to help you in the classroom? Um, we're going to talk about what's next for AI in education. Where is it going? Where do we think things are going to look like? Uh, future casting. We're going to talk about how to, you know, prep chat and jet, chat GPT to get what we want out of it um, using just the right prompts that uh, Dan has come up with. And we're going to leverage AI for UDL guidelines. So we have a lot of great stuff coming up in our hour. Um, make sure, again, you put things in the chat as they come up. When you have ideas, when you have questions, when you want to say anything, put it in LinkedIn, put it in YouTube, put it in Facebook or wherever you're watching tonight. Awesome. I'm going to um, quit with the comments so we can see Dan's lovely face. Hey, I'm Buck. <laughs> All right, great. So the first thing we're going to address is what is it? Like, what is artificial intelligence in education? And when I've been going around talking to people, not many people in education that I know are actually talking about this very much. We're in the thick of things with our year. It is, you know, February. Um, we got testing coming around the corner. There's a lot of chatter on this online, but a lot of people don't quite know what exactly this means for the future of education and what it's going to look like. It's going to change things. And we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. Which is funny because um, I think we you're like I hang out in the ed tech space and everyone that I'm connected to is talking about artificial intelligence and education. So there is a big divide there. There are those who are talking a lot about it. Those who are like, oh, ban it. I don't want to touch it. And then and then those who just have no clue. 
So absolutely. Absolutely. So if you'll if you'll drop in the chat what artificial intelligence and education means to you. And um, we're going to be pulling up some of your comments as we kind of hash that out. All right, cool. So when we think about artificial intelligence and education and what it is, let's first define what artificial intelligence is in the first place. So um, if you could go on to that next slide, Amanda. Give me one second. I'm just going to check that out. There we go. All right, cool. So artificial intelligence, um, you know, the definition is basically using computers, machines. What we're trying to do is imitate humans. Like we're trying to mimic some of the things that humans could otherwise do, uh, make some of the decisions that humans might otherwise make um, to accomplish a task. And we're going to talk about why, you know, this is a good thing. And what are those limitations? What are the things that don't necessarily get replaced? with this and why we can't just rely completely on artificial intelligence. Man, the comments are coming in so fast. I can't keep up. So um, some of them are like, yes, photo, you know, photo math um, and chat GPT, um, digital equity and as accessibility, which is um, one of the things I'm definitely going to cover is that access and equity. Um, there's arguments. We'll, we'll get into the limitations in a minute, but uh, let's see. Um, saving more time. Um, Allison says, not sure what AI means to education, but very interested, then you're in the right place. More time for teachers. And that's the, that's the barrier to access right there. I think that's, that's like the easy entryway into AI is um, in the past years, teacher accountability has rose with high stakes testing, um, the amount of lesson planning we have to do, the accountability on our end. And um, a lot of educators, what I'm seeing they're most excited about, is, which is just skimming the cir circle, is that time-saving aspect of, of having ChatGPT and other educational platforms that use the GPT-3 technology to um, streamline their work process and their workflow. All right, awesome. So... Now that we know which, what AI is, we're going to think about this from an education perspective and how I've thought about it. Things are going to change. Things are coming and, you know, we don't have the old things like we, we came, we got, we, we have motorized cars. We used to have horses, like things are coming fast. Are we going to be able to adapt? So I look at it like this, like we're going to have to work collaboratively with machines. Like what can machines do? What can I do? It doesn't mean we're handing over the reins to everything that we do to machines or we're handing over the reins to uh, the technology. But how can we work in harmony? How can we work cohesively to complete tasks? And how do we make our jobs easier as we're going to talk about in just a second? You've heard of ChatGPT. I think this AI has been around for a while. It's been around, you know, for 50 years or so. Uh, even longer, but chat GPT. We're like being... seven. What was that? I, I said um, more, more on the lines of 70, unless you want to go back yeah, to when about the 1950s or, yeah, or so. It's when he was creating the, um, the, the armored suits. Like he, mm -hmm. he did some of the first AI like sketches. So. I, I, absolutely. So when you're thinking about this, you have ChatGPT, which really springboard this into education. Like it really got people talking about, you know, it, all of a sudden AI is here. It's been here for a while, but that was really the jolt that got a lot of people excited about it, in my opinion. Um, Google has Bard. We have Microsoft's Bing Chat. Um, surely more to come on the rise. Um, and a lot of the uh, resources that we're going to talk about are actually fueled by these things and these technologies. Um, they use OpenAI to do great things. Oh, Help to write a cover letter for a job application. That is that is awesome, and uh, they, they use it in, a, in a, they use it in court the other day. Uh, there, there was a, a judge that used was it a judge that used it just the other day? Yeah, I think did he get it to write the, the his like kind of closing remarks? Uh -huh. So he put in kind of what he wanted it to say in bullet points, and it and it wrote him um, a really nice script for him to read out. Um, yeah, absolutely. Now that being said. Let's talk about the limitations of AI in education. Um, I, want, I want to address this because it's going to come up. And when I posted this, you know, advertisement for this webinar tonight, a lot of, like there were some people that just said no. Like like I posted an ad and they just no, not doing it. Um, you know, and and I'm thinking, okay, 
how do we how do we talk about the limitations and address those head on so that people feel a little bit more safe with this technology and what it looks like? So if you could go ahead and pull up a few of those limitations, Amanda. So with with ChatGPT, um, you know, it's trained up to 2021, so it doesn't know current events. It doesn't know what happened yesterday. Um, it's not the most up to date with what's happening. So if there's new research and new papers and things that just happened, it might not quite have that technology or quite have access to that information. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, we have the data protection and we're worried about what's going to happen with that. We're worried about where the data is going. Is it safe? Um, we do have the age restrictions. You know, I believe you have to be, what, 13 to get on chat GPT. Um, 18. 18 now. I think there was a lot of confusion around it, but yeah. uh, there was a, yeah. there was an Australian educator emailed OpenAI um, just last week, and they clarified that it's thirteen. Awesome. Words. So thirteen, um, yes. Yeah. You have to have parental permission, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So a lot of the there's a lot of platforms that that's distinctly say eighteen, um, and then the ones that are thirteen, typically your um, technology user agreement that you have with your school. If you if, if students check that box and the, in, in your technology user agreement, you include apps like ChatGPT, you should be fine and covered for students to be able to use these. Uh, absolutely. And again, it's brand new um, in schools for the most part. So that's something that we'll have to talk to our schools with, our school districts, our principal, um, just to get clarification. All right. It's still in the research stage. Um, it's still learning all the time. Um, it, it's not fully fleshed out. And because of that, and my last bullet point on the slide was it might learn and propagate biases. So it's only as good as the input it's being fed. Um, so if the people adding the input, the people writing the articles, it has a hard time sometimes separating fact from fiction. Um, and, you know, it's going to get better with that. There's ways around that. But as of right now, you know, it might think a certain way about a certain group of people based on the history that it's read. So it's not it's not 100 uh, percent without bias right now. It does a really good job, but you're going to run into that. And it's really good to be aware of that. Um, just in case. So be on the lookout for that. And I haven't come across it very much, but it definitely still can happen. It does get fed human input. Absolutely. And um, on that note, um, when we are feeding these machines our human input, we're also passing on our biases, like our, our, bi our biases. And um, there's a great movie, if, if you haven't seen it, it's called Marjorie Prime. And it questions like what it means to be human and and uh, and it really magnifies the fragility of of the human race, but also how those um, how that fragility and and the like our ability to remember things. So essentially, um, John Hamm plays an AI caretaker who comes to take care of his uh, his wife. He's programmed because it's someone familiar, and he he help, reminds her to take meds and everything that's input into him, he starts um, remembering things differently from how they happen because they are how the, hu how the human brain remembered it later in life. So the decline of memory and just, just um, really hammering in on how AI is dependent on that input. Absolutely. All right, some additional in inputs or some additional limitations. The outputs are only as good as the inputs. Dan is gonna get into this with his PrEP model. But essentially, if you ask it questions that don't necessarily uh, get the, the better question you ask, the more precise question you ask, the better you input the right information, the better you're going to get an output that is, um, you know, extremely useful to you. So you have to know how to use the system itself, um, just like you can have a grade book, but you can do grades poorly. You can have a car, but you can drive the car poorly. You know, the car only drives as well as the, as the human driving it kind of thing. So uh, Dan's going to get deep into that as far as like, how do we feed ChatGPT, Google, Bing, and all these other things so we get the results that we want as educators. Another limitation I want to talk about is mindset. Um, when we think about mindset, like I was saying before, the person that just said no to this, they, they don't even know really what artificial intelligence and education means, um, but they're already saying, no, I'm not going to do this. So um, when you think about mindset also, are we being replaced as teachers? I would argue no. I would argue that we're going to make our job a little bit easier and manageable so we can spend most of our time building relationships. We can spend more of our time being creative, um, building bonds, um, thinking at a deeper level when you think about this. So the mindset is, and, and also with imagination, this can do so many things. We just have to come up with those things that it can do. I've seen ChatGPT do 
crazy things. So it's only limited in way by our imagination and what we input to the system and what we ask it to do. Um, and it's going to get even more powerful as we go. So if you're kind of on the fence about this, I understand that 100%. But think, what can this do? How can this help versus, no, it's a machine. I am all against it. I'm not even going to look into this whatsoever because it's here. It's here to stay. And we might as well figure out how to use it. All right, some of the benefits. There is a question, is there an example of a technology user agreement? Um, if anyone has an example and they want to share in the chat, uh, we'll share it with our, our participants. Um, because the technology is very new, um, technology user agreements are being drafted everywhere to, uh, to kind of be reactive to the technology that's come on the scene, so. Absolutely. So what are the benefits? So we talk a lot about it's not all doom and gloom. How can we use this to enhance our instruction, to help students learn, to really make our jobs easier? So if you could go on to the next slide, Amanda. So there's a lot of benefits, but if I were to summarize the benefits, um, we're going to have a framework for learning. Like how can you learn with chat GPT or artificial intelligence at the center? Um, learn in harmony with ChatGPT and the machine learning and all of those kinds of great things. Um, so how can we use this as the center of our instruction? But if you don't want to just flat out change everything you do all at once, how can we use this to enhance existing pedagogies? Like how can you use this for design thinking? How can you use this for UDL? How can you use this for Genius Hour? How can you use this in project-based learning? Like how can this aid a lot of the things and a lot of the ways we already teach? Because teaching, you know, is effective and a lot of the things that we do are great, but how can we make this just a part of what we do instead of throwing out everything right at once? Um, somebody mentioned critical thinking skills. Yes, we're actually going to get into that as well, because humans are not going to be replaced per se, um, but the things that we bring to the mix are going to need to change a little bit. So when we're thinking about saving time, how can we grade things quicker? How can we make lessons quicker? How can we make entire units quicker? Um, and Dan's going to get into a lot of that as well. But our goal here is to save you a lot of time. Also, putting students in control of their learning. So when you think about um, putting students in control of their learning, you know, how can we make this more student-centered? How do we teach students to use this technology? And uh, how does this look in the student-facing um, spectrum? Think about getting immediate feedback on what you're writing. Um, think, think about... Uh, asking the questions yourself as a student, learning how to use the technology to create new things. Accessibility for all is my last bullet point here. When I think accessibility for all, and Amanda's gonna get into the UDL portion of this, but how can we access learning for all learners? Um, all types of learners, all types of, uh, you know, different students that we have in our classrooms. This is gonna make learning way more accessible to everyone. It's going to be a great equalizer in education from the way that I see it. Um, is there any, is there anything in here, Dan or Amanda, I've talked for a few minutes in a row. Did I miss anything about the benefits or maybe the uh, drawbacks to AI? Um, I, th I think one of the benefits is uh, like, so AI is basically, or, or chat GPT, which is, which is what everyone's um, going cuckoo about is a, it's, it's basically taking all of the uh, search terms like if you if for example if you look at wikipedia or you look at a google search it's going to turn you back all these pages chat gpt the benefit of it is it's going to give you a concise summarized um, response based on your input um, you can refine that that output that you get um, you can have you can definitely leverage uh, critical thinking with that it depends on like the activities that you're getting the students to do in the classroom and um, dan's going to go into some chat gpt prompting and and how to prep how to prep the machine in order to get um, appropriate responses. I know personally I've used it to uh, like writing my own content and putting it into chat GP and asking them to reword it or make this more concise or, you know, what is the main idea of, of the sentence? So having students look in terms of literacy, look at their own writing and put it in and analyze writing structures. I think that could be beneficial in, um, literature and English classrooms. So there is a place for this. It's just, we need to learn how to use it as teachers before we can teach te uh, students how to use it effectively to um, make it a learning tool. There's a lot of worry about plagiarism. Um, and I mean, plagiarism has been around since, you know, 
I don't know, books <laughs> since, since, you know, we, we've been writing. So this tool is, is just another tool that we have to worry about that students can access to plagiarize. But I don't, I don't think that should be a barrier to entry. Yeah. I think uh, Judy, Judy's just asked, are we going to demonstrate it? We are in just a, in just a, in just a minute, Judy. Um, so to hold on tight. I think for me, it, it, there's, there's like a threefold benefit uh, structure and the first one has been the the kind of using it to assist the teacher um, and we're already seeing educators around the world using it to help them prepare lessons help them to prepare um, resources um, lesson plans and, and we're going to go into into that I think that's very very short term in terms of in terms of how we use it because we can, we can do that now with it and if you think of this technology almost like the internet was in the mid 90s no one could have imagined where the internet would have went and then, I mean, if you look 10 years after that, Steve Jobs is introducing the, the, the iPhone, the iterations of the internet that we have now. No one knows where this technology is going to go. However, I think there's, there's another element there, and, and one that the media likes to talk about is assessment. How is, it going to, how is it going to impact assessment? And I think the one thing that really excites me in that regard is personalization. How, how can assessment become more personalized? How can it, how can it help prepare students for the world that they're going to go in where when they're in the world of work they are going to they're going to be kind of it's going to be a personal journey they're not going to be given the same task as the person next to them they're not going to be given the the precise instructions the precise resources so how do we make assessment more true to real life and personalized that excites me but i think in the longer term and, and actually i don't think this will be such a longer term but for me, it's how does this impact learning in just in general? Because, and I'm seeing some of the comments in the chat where people are saying, actually, this let's keep this away from our, our students. The truth is, students are using it already. They're learning from it already. So it's how do we facilitate them in using it to, 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 so that it's impactful and that they're actually using it in a, in a good way that's going to really benefit them in terms of building their skills. It really excites me. I know we, we kind of have to go, go through the limitations. Any tech tool has limitations, but I think, I think we're in a new era now, and that's why we've called this webinar and this book uh, the AI Classroom Teaching and Learning in the Artificial Intelligence Revolution because – I think we really do think that this is this is a new era now and the education system has tended to avoid disruption like the rest of the world has and a lot of other industries have um, over recent decades and I think we're reaching a time now where education will be disrupted and we have to we have to be creative within this time we have to put our heads together get around a table and think what are the creative solutions how how does education move with the times in 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 providing our students what they need to to be successful. Okay, right. Let's get into some some of the the practicalities. Um, I'm going to go through just. I'm going to very basically at the start tell you what ChatGPT is for those who who aren't too sure. So ChatGPT um, is essentially um, it's a it's a chatbot. OK, so it's a chatbot that was built by OpenAI. It was released in late November of last year. So this has all happened very quickly. And it was kind of the, the, the technology, the tool that instigated kind of this getting everybody talking and, 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 and the buzz around this new technology. It's based on, a, on, a, on an, AI, um, an AI system called GPT. OK, so they added the chat bit onto it. And, they, and OpenAI built that. Uh, as a, an AI system to understand and respond to human language. And they trained it on approximately 300 billion words. It's a lot, a lot of words there. So 300 billion words worth of information. So books, uh, the in, a, a lot of articles from the internet, and so on. And they did that so that it would simulate natural human conversation. And as a result of that, as you can imagine, it's got a large, large knowledge base um, and, and for those of you who have actually tried it and, and played around with it, you'll you'll see that. And I think what's impressive about that is that it works very very similar to how a human brain pulls information. So it doesn't just if I ask it a question, 
about, let's say, Paris, the capital city of, of France, it doesn't just find a Wikipedia article from its database and present that to me. What it does is it 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 goes out into its database and it finds lots of different information and, and within a split second it presents that back through the filter of of a of a simulated human conversation. Very much how we would do it as well as as humans with it within our within a split second, I would I would search my experiences, my knowledge base of what I've what I've gained over the last 36 years of my life. And I, then I would present it to you through the filter of my my language, what I the, what I use to communicate. So it it's very similar. I think we're using a version called um, GPT 3.5 at the moment. GPT 4 is already trained and it has 500 times the information. It's going to be a lot more powerful and it's also benefiting from the interactions that the current chat GPT um, is, is having. And there are, and as Brad said, there are other tools out there. Google um, brought out Bard, which is, which is it's slowly releasing at the moment. I think it was announced today or yesterday that Amazon are going to be making their own version available um, through Amazon Web Services, so that people who have their websites with Amazon Web Services or platforms can then integrate it as well. So this isn't going away. And in fact, the CEO of OpenAI said that this time next year we're going to look back on this technology that we're using right now as antiquated as out of date essentially so it's going to get better and better so how can we use it now how can we start using it to our advantage as teachers so if we can go to the next slide thanks amanda so it's all about how we how we kind of communicate with it because we can actually and i'm going to i'm going to pull up chat gpt now so i'm just going to Present my screen, and then hopefully that's going to pop up for you. There we go. So I can just ask it a basic question. So I could just say, right, I'm a, I'm a science teacher, and I'm going to type in write some questions on cells for a biology class. And what it'll do is very, very quickly, it'll start giving me questions that I can ask students in a biology class. However... They've, how do I know that they're for the that they're going to be geared towards the students who I teach? How do I know that they're going to be based on the information that I've taught them? Okay, so we have to be specific, and I think the number one rule, and hopefully, if you do go away with one thing from this webinar, it's that the quality of the input, the quality of your question, dictates the quality of the response that you're going to get. Okay, so what I've done is I've. I've created a model that I, that I want you to use. I want you to take, I want you to steal for yourself and 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 maybe come up with even a better model. Um, and and I'm, it's called PrEP. And Amanda, if we could just switch back to the slides, that would be amazing. Thank you. And just remember, when you're asking a question, to PrEP the machine, okay? So PrEP is an acronym. So it stands for prompt. So you want to give it a prompt. Um, just waiting for the slides to come back up. So you want to give it a prompt. You want to tell it what to do. You want to give it a role. Now, a lot of people laugh when I say, when I say that, but it actually works. If you tell ChatGPT that you want it to take on the role, a certain persona, it will use, it will, it will do that and it will pull down the information it needs to become that role. You want to give it explicit instructions. You want to be very precise with it. And you also want to give it clear parameters. So I'm going to give you an example of that now. So I'm going to, if we can switch um, back to chat GPT, that'd be great. Thanks, Amanda. Um, so instead of just a generic question, what if I use the prep model and really thought about what I wanted I'm just going to copy and paste this in here and because nobody wants to to watch me um, trying to type this in. Um, so I'm, I'm going to give it a prompt first. Remember, prep, prompt, P for prompt. So create some retrieval questions. Then I'm going to give it a role. So you are an eighth grade teacher who teaches science, you specialize in biology, and you use retrieval practice with your students. So quite a, quite a clear role there for it. I can get more detailed if I need to. Then I'm going to give it some explicit instructions okay so i've give it the prompt give it the rule 
I'm onto the E of prep explicit instructions. So create a set of questions about cells for your eighth grade students. Use retrieval practice to set these questions over the next three weeks. Then I'm going to set some parameters. So that the final P of prep. Write them with a reading age of 12 years old. Organize them in a format that shows which days to use them over the next three weeks. And I'm going to click submit. And we're going to let ChatGPT do its thing. And here it goes. And you can see because I have set the parameters there, because I've asked it specifically what I want, it is doing that. And it's, it's doing that day by day for me. And you can see, I can, and because this is a chatbot, the beauty of this is I can go back and forth with it. So I think a lot of people make the mistake of asking it a question, seeing the response and going, well, that's not, that's not very good. It's not, it's not really suitable for, for what I want. Chat GPT, these AI tools just aren't there yet. They're not great. And then they leave it. Actually, the way it works is it's a it's a human conversation simulation tool. So we have to have a conversation with it. So like I might look at that and think, well, okay, it's give me two questions per day. Actually, I'll go back to it and say, write five questions per day. Okay. So it's a trap, but I can have that conversation with it. And then I can change it. I might think, you know what? I wasn't really specific enough with with the type of students I have. So I might go back and and, and ask it to change various parts. So just a very simple way to, to get you using this. And if you if you do have access right now to, to chat GPT, then have a play around with this. And if you've never tried this before, hopefully this has shown you the, the power that this has have when you just start off basic with it. But really can't emphasize enough the questioning is so important use that prep model i've created that for you for teachers so that you can dive straight in at the deep end with this and you don't have to kind of learn all the the, the mistakes i learned at the start with figuring out how to get precise with it figuring out how to get what i needed out of it you can go in at a more advanced stage using that prep model so the next thing i'm going to do is i'm going to we're going to get let's let's go for it let's let's go in a bit more complex so i want to i'm going to ask it to create a full lessons worth of resources for me okay now i love this example because when i was a teacher i i was on the senior leadership team of a of a high school um in the north of england and i would normally spend i don't know about you but i would normally spend one day of my weekend normally a sunday doing work so Saturday would be my family day. Sunday would be my work day. I wasn't getting paid for that. It was kind of a voluntary day. I'd also work on evenings. I'd normally work through my lunch break as well. Not getting paid for that. And I really think the education system, when it demands that of us teachers, and, I'm, and I think it does all over the world, um, we need to rethink it. We need to, we need to think, how can we claim our personal time back? And I think this is a tool that's going to help us do that. And I want to show you an example because when I would work on a Sunday, I'd probably prep a few lessons. With this tool, you can do that in literally just a few minutes, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to – let's go with a, an example. I've got two different types of lessons here I want to show you. So I'm going to go with this lesson first. I'm going to click New Chat. So when using ChatGPT, always good to, to start a new chat, that button in the top left-hand corner. Um, right, so I'm going to ask it to create a, a design thinking lesson. Okay, so I'm, that's my prompt. I'm going to give it a role. You are a high school geography teacher. I'm going to give it some explicit instructions. This is for a grade 10 class, and they are problem solving the climate crisis. So this might be a, a lesson that you might have as a geography teacher. And then, and then my parameters are create a structure for the lesson so you can see in this example i haven't been too specific with it in terms of but the using the prep model is still going to help me to get something worthwhile back from it so i'm going to click submit and what that's going to do as you can see here it's going to design that full lesson for me now this is doing it in in literally seconds 
And as Brad talked about earlier as well, there was there's limitations to this. You're going to want to double check it. You're going to want to critically analyze what what you're seeing it produce because there's some variables that that you know about that ChatGPT might not necessarily know about. And and the biggest one probably is the students who you have in front of you. You know those students and. And, and I heard and I read a few people talking about this in the chat um, just earlier as well, that the the value of the human teacher is still here because you have those relationships with students. You know those students, you know their ability, you know their progress in learning. And so you're going to want to cast your eye over this and make sure that it's suitable for them. And there we've go. We've got the we've got a full lesson there. In fact, I think we've got more than one lesson. Um, judging by the times on there, so ten minutes, twenty minutes, fifteen, twenty-five minutes, we've probably got we've probably got two lessons worth of a, a design sprint there. So, if anyone is familiar with design thinking, it would be referred to as a, as a design sprint where we get students to problem solve. If you if you you might not do this type of task in your in your school or your college, um, you might do more traditional lessons. So, let's do something similar but a bit more traditional. So I'm going to paste in this. Um, so again, using the prep model, create a lesson. You are a high school geography teacher. Write three paragraphs about the demographic transition model for a class of grade nine students. Include a multiple choice question at the end of each paragraph. So that's um, what we used to call a hinge question so that we can gauge if, how much students have understood before we move on. Create one list of all subject-specific words with brief definitions. Create four activities at the end, basing them on Bloom's taxonomy. So being specific with Bloom's taxonomy there, I know that the activities are going to stretch students. They're going to develop their learning. Create one group task based on the content, and then write this with a region age of nine years old. So I'm asking it a lot of things here. Can it do it for this more traditional style lesson? Well, let's have a look. And literally within a fraction of a second, it's it's going there and it's going fast. And it's right in that first paragraph for us. And then there's my first hinge question, my first multiple choice question. Now, what you can do with this, obviously, once you've once you've proofed it and once you've had a look at it, is when I was teaching, we would we would move this to a to a booklet or to a worksheet, and it would be the main resource for the lesson. So we'd go through this with students. We'd we might want to be a bit more creative with the the hinge questions. Maybe bring some tech into the. But you can see that it's doing precisely what I asked it to do, and that's no accident. I I worked at this. I using that prep model. I I put a lot of time in trying to come up with the 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 right framework to help you get the most out of out of this. And you will when you signed up for this this webinar as well we 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 give you that free guide and and what i'm talking about today the examples here are in that free guide so you will find a, a template for this in your free guide as well as many others as well that we just won't have time in this webinar to cover but that you can start using today now it it stopped there so if you if you noticed it's just said group task working and it stopped it has a it has a word limitation on on its output. So if that does happen, all you all you have to do is simply type in something like continue, and it will keep writing for you. So it's creating the group task there, and you can see how detailed this is. This is something that is really gonna. I think normally, um, and it, look at that. It's even it's even said good luck at the end. So it's. It's something that you can take, you're going to want to check over, but think of the time that that's going to save you, okay? Think of the time that that's going to, personal time that you can then spend with your friends and family on a weekend, on an evening. Um, again, you could, it did that in what, let's say two minutes. You might want to spend a little bit of time looking over it and maybe tweaking it, but still 15, 20 minutes maybe overall on, on, a, on a lesson that might have took you an hour, two hours to create. The time-saving reality of this is just phenomenal. 
And when I when I post a lot about this on my Twitter, um, I have been accused of clickbait before. And my response is always clickbait is is a headline that that doesn't deliver, doesn't deliver on the promise. But this this delivers, it delivers every time in terms of the the hours that it's going to save us as teachers and the time it's going to give us back our own personal time. Um there, there are so many ways we can use this. So I've I've gone through the questioning, I've gone through two different types of lesson. Another one that really excites teachers is marking and feedback as well. And let me give you an example of that. And I'm going to give you an example from because I'm in the UK. This is a this is a British exam question. So in the UK, when students get to 16 years old, what we do is they, they do GCSE exams. And one of the exams is an, an English language exam. So what I've done here is I've taken a question from an English language GCSE exam, and I'm going to put into it the, the question. I'm going to put in the student's answer, and I'm going to put in the mark scheme or the rubric so that it knows how to mark it. So here we go. I'm just going to paste this in here, and I'll take you through it. So I've got my prompt. What would you grade this answer and why? So very, I don't just want the grade here. I want I want a reason. I want to know why it's graded it this way. Um, question is there, and that's just copy and pasted from the exam paper. We've got the student's answer here. Now, one of the when I whenever I demo this, one of the questions I always get is, um, especially I'm not I'm not sure about where you are, but in the UK still, our, our exams are written with pen and paper. So teachers always ask, well, how how do we get the students' handwriting into into text so we can use it in ChatGPT? Um, it, the chances are you've got that tool on your your mobile phone. So if you've got an Android phone, you probably have Google Lens in there um or you can download the google lens app there's a microsoft lens version and apple have got their own version as well and what that does is it uses your phone's camera or your tablet's camera um, to scan handwriting and it can turn that into text that you can then just copy and paste into chat gpt literally takes seconds so we've got the student answer there and then we've got a mark scheme this is from a an exam specification and I've just copied and pasted it in there. And I'm going to click Submit, and let's see what it does. So literally within half a second there, it's already graded it. And now it's telling me why it's graded it like this. So it's linking the student's answer back to that mark scheme to give me quite a detailed response there of why it's graded it like it has. And I, I've worked with teachers, probably hundreds of teachers over the last couple of months where they've they've tested this out. And the sometimes it's not always perfect, but then human markers aren't always perfect. And some and a lot of marking is very subjective anyway. Uh, but more times than not, it's coming back with with the the agreed grade that teachers would give it so try that out for yourself see and i'm not saying that this is to replace us i'm saying this is this is going to help with the the level of feedback we give a student back this is going to be if we're marking work this is going to be a, a virtual second marker for us so that we can double check and make sure that that we're on the right lines and 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 also it's, it's going to imagine this in the student's hands. So before even the student hands in their work to be able to, to improve their work based on the, the feedback that a tool like ChatGPT has given them is phenomenal. Um, if I'm just going to finish my bit here, if Amanda, do you mind just switching back to the, that's fantastic. So I, what I want to just finish this section by saying that, um, a lot of a lot of people have been kind of there's been a lot of scaremongering going on saying that well AI is going to make our students lazy it's going to make our students not want to write and I think the opposite is true I really believe that because anybody who knows anything about this technology knows and hopefully you <laughs> this message has come across really clear anybody who uses this technology knows that you've got to have good literacy skills in order to get good content from it. 
so remember the input, the quality of the input dictates the quality of the output. So our students are going to need high levels of literacy skills. And I really think that the it's a red heron, this false dichotomy of, of literacy versus AI, because both are intimately connected here. And I think literacy skills are going to determine the level of AI skills and AI skills are going to be connected to literacy skills. Uh, next slide, please, Amanda. Just to end on this note before I hand over to Amanda, um, outsource the doing, not the thinking. Okay, I think human creativity is still so vital here. Still, it's what makes us al feel alive. It's what gives us fullness of life, being able to create and, and find and satisfaction in that. And as teachers, it's a big part of who we are, getting to create these resources, getting to create learning experiences that that let's be honest, change lives, change our students' lives. So outsource the doing. AI will help us do it, but don't outsource the thinking. Keep your own autonomy in this new AI revolution. And hopefully that's been of some use to you. We've gotten very practical there, and hopefully you've tried it out yourself. And um, I'm really looking forward to, to what Amanda's got to say now because I think this is going to be an exciting part. So over to you, Amanda. All right. So um, I'm just going to change some slides real quick. Um, I'm going to present in full screen because um, I have uh, some Genially slides that I've made some interactive slides. Uh, and I'm going to be sharing some of um, these graphics with you in the chat. So stick around and toward the end of my presentation, I'll be sharing some of the interactive slides that are in there. Let's see. All right, I'm just gonna go into present mode here. All right, so um, what is universal design for learning? So um, everyone's familiar with ChatGPT and ChatGPT can definitely leverage uh, making accommodations and, and creating lessons and activities for students that cater to all of the students in our classrooms, not just some. And I think Dan just gave us a good overview of how to do that. Um, but what I want to focus on is the teaching methodologies that we use and designing, you know, lessons that are inclusive and equitable. There's a lot of talk about how chat, chat GPT can um, increase the equity divide for students that don't have access. There's a, a popular video. Um, there's two students on or two groups of students on a stage. On one side, they're using textbooks to find the answers. On the other side, they're using a computer. Um, I think now if we put someone um, on one side of the stage with a computer without chat GPT, and on the other side, they have chat GPT, chat GPT is going to give them a more succinct, pointed answer to a question where the people on the other side of the stage um, would be relying on um, a Google search return and um, vetting sources, which um, one of the things that we need to be wary of is media literacy. Um, someone said earlier in the chat that not all, like the, the output, what we're getting back from chat GPT, um, it might not, it, it might have biases. It might not have correct information. And that's where media literacy is important and still comes into play in our classroom because we need to make sure that we're teaching students if they're using this tool to be able to confirm and corroborate the information that they're getting. So um, what is UDL? So I'm going to focus on um, UD UDL representation. So there are three components. There's engagement, how we're engaging students with content um, in terms of their background knowledge, how they like to work, whether it's solo or, or group work, representation, um, and then action and expression. Representation is making sure that we take into account individuals, um, their learning disabilities, and, and how they learn in order to transfer knowledge um, between concepts. And then there's action and expression. So um, moving forward, we're just going to look real quick at how they break down. Engagement looks at, at recruiting interests, sustaining effort and persistence and self-regulation, representation, which is what the rest of this presentation is going to be based on, um, is the what of learning. It focuses on how students perceive information, the language and symbols we use as teachers, and how they comprehend it. Then there's action and expression. Um, this is the how. 
So um, how are they going about learning? How are they communicating um, that learning, their executive functions, how they're processing it, and then um, the physical action that's involved? It's not letting me move forward. So um, some of these graphics have interactivity. So this breaks down um, further the perception. I'm just going to escape full, full screen real quick. So how can AI support UDL? Um, I have a couple of AI tools that we're going to be looking at. Um, ChatGPT, which Dan just covered. Um, I want us to think outside of ChatGPT. Um, AI has been around for a long time. And um, there are a lot of tools that leverage AI technologies. So AI and machine, there was a question earlier, um, is chat GPT machine learning or is it AI? It is both. So machine learning is a subset of AI. It's important that um, it's used. Or, and, and there's also natural language processing, which chat GPT uses. It, 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 it learns based on what users are inputting. So um, looking at... 10 different artificial intelligence tools that we can use to leverage um, UDL representation principles. There's Murph AI, and I'm just going to go back into present mode real quick um, as it's an interactive slide, and I will be sharing this one with you. So um, Murph AI, if we look at Murph and UDL, this is a text-to-speech technology that addresses several UDL guidelines. UDL perception is um, designing learning experiences where students um, interact flexibly with the content, so um, specifically providing audio for text. So you can um, take a script from a... Uh, from a lesson, you can pop it into Murph AI and you can um, turn that into actual actual text. And we're gonna we're gonna look at that real quick in a second. Um, next is uh, Pictory. So Pictory um, allows us to essentially so. Um, it, it uses text equivalents in the form of captions. So if you have a video that you've created and you don't have captions for it, um, we know a code memory um, isn't, there's no permanence to it. With text, there's permanence. You can actually form captions to your videos and, and automate them for, for uh, any of the audio that is in that file. Then there's WordTune. Um, so WordTune, well, let's, let's stick with perception. So the ones on the left here, Murph, Pictory, VoiceMaker, and Otter.ai focus on perception. Um, VoiceMaker, it also allows you to, um, it has text-to-speech technology where you can input text and then have it come out speech. And this, like when we're, when we're designing lessons, we need to make sure that not only are we visually using, representing information, um, through visual aids, graphics, images, and videos, but there's auditory learning or auditory um, components that allow users to listen, and then that the text is also there for them to, to read. So having multiple means of engagement is important. And the links to all of these tools are available in this graphic. Um, and then there's Otter AI. So if you have, if you're a virtual teacher and you have virtual meetings, um, Otter AI is an extension that you can use that allows um, that allows you to create transcripts for your meetings. So if I have a Zoom meeting or a Google Meet, if I have the Otter.ai extension attached to that, it will create a tr not only a text transcript of the file, but a clickable text transcript. So um, I will get the whole transcript from the meeting. It'll be time stamped. And then if I click on the text, it'll also it also includes an audio transcript. So um, sound is particularly an effective way to convey um, the impact of information. Um, human voice is important for conveying emotion and um, intonation. So um, when it comes to prosody or that natural rhythm of how, how people talk, some of the chatbots and some of the AI to voice uh, platforms don't do justice to that natural rhythm of language. 
with Otter AI, it actually records your voice in the transcripts. And when you click again, when you click on any part of that transcript, it will play that audio part of the meeting back for you, which I, I think is absolutely brilliant. Um, Word tune. So when we're looking at language and processing skills with UDL, um, it's good to chunk information and outline it. Um, there is data that, that uh, supports that about 30% of what we read is what we remember. So when we're able to create outlines with headings, subheadings that are bolded, um, we're able to uh, remember information. It, it chunks it for us. It summarizes the information and it provides scaffolds for students that struggle with literacy. So um, focusing outside of cheating and plagiarism, using tools like WordTune, which is another Google Chrome extension. It allows us to um, control <clears throat> the speed and tone. It provides an auditory component. And then again, it breaks down large or long text. And then we have to um, make sure that we also pay attention to our um, dominant languages in our classroom, but also the home language of our students. So there are a lot of uh, students that I've taught in the past that English is not their primary language. So Deep L Translator, it actually allows you to trans, it has access to 26 different languages. You can take scripts, um, lesson plans, assignments, and um, drop them into to Deep L, and it will translate it into that student's native language. So we're providing um, all of our resources in the dominant language, which would be English and also the first languages of our students that have that limited English profic proficiency. Um, then there's also Curapod. So Curapod is, is kind of like ChatGPT with lesson design, but it's geared toward education. It also creates um, PowerPoints, it creates questions, exit tickets, and we're gonna do a demo of that in just a second. Um, DID is like, Another platform that's similar to is called Synthesia. So um, DID allows us to create a avatar, a, like a virtual avatar. We can upload a photo or use any of their stock avatars that they have. We input a script and then we have a virtual avatar that is in video form communicating the information to students. So um, this, this is fantastic because it provides differentiated models um, and, and mentors. So, um, we can actually like flipping your classroom or putting on video content that's teaching materials. They can rewatch it. It's called rewindable learning. And, um, and st there are students that, you know, th they, they're deaf and, and mute. I've, I've taught students who were voluntary mute, but, um, when it came time to create, lessons and communicate their learning, they could type their script into DID, which I didn't have this at the time, um, that this would have been a great resource for them to, uh, to create videos of avatars actually communicating their learning. There, we've covered ChatGPT, and then there's also G GPT Itionary. It's um, essentially, essentially a dictionary where you can look up words. And um, this is great for teaching denotation and connotation and nuances in language. So when we look at the representation um, and perception, um, this offers ways to customize the display of information, alternatives for auditory information, and it offers alternatives for visual information. So I'm going to um, stop screen share real quick, and I'm going to uh, go into my window so I can go back and forth between my tabs. So when we look at MRF, there's a voice for every need. So if I go into the studio, so I have a couple of projects that I created in here. Um, you can go to template. Um, there's different templates that you can use. Um, there is a freemium of, uh, of eight minutes or of, of 10 minutes. I've used eight. So if I create a project, this is just going to be webinar example. 
Um, you can do audio or video. For the purpose of this, I'm going I'm, I'm using audio e-learning module. Let me get create project. So once we're in, you can explore the different AI voices that are available to you. Um, and I'm going to search by English, U.S., female, um, all age groups. And there are pro voices, but there's also free voices. You can listen to a demo. You can also Okay, so I'm going to select Hannah because she's free. Oop. Go back to Hannah. Select. So I've got Hannah here and I can paste my text in here. Hi, I'm, or I can just um, type it. I'm an AI voiceover artist, period. Um, you can adjust the pitch. We're going to listen real quick. You can adjust the speed. You can also add in natural pauses. And with some of the adults, you can also add intonation. You can add whether they're excited or um, whether they're serious. So the tone of their voice is also, you, you can also do that as well. Um, you, can, you can import scripts. You can add voice changers. So this is exactly what I did for our, um, our demo video for, um, for this webinar. So after I created my, my voice, You, again, you can add the pauses, you can change the speed and the pitch. So once you have your script and you've played around with the pitch, the speed and the intonation and you have it like you like you want it, you're just going to download it. You're going to export the file or you can share, you can actually share a link to that file. And, and embed it in your um, lesson plans that you're creating to add uh, voice. So um, once once I did that, I went into um, Mid Journey. So Mid Journey actually allows you to create um, art using um, an AI generative art creator. So in order to use Mid Journey, you have to join Discord. So um, here is the Mid Journey Discord. Once you join, you're going to go to a newbie channel. Um, once, once you're in to generate art, you put forward slash imagine. And I could put um, a, so again, thinking of um, Dan's prep model. It's a little different with AI art, but you can you can follow the same suit. And the beautiful thing is, is you can see what everyone else is creating and you can learn how to prompt the machine from reading other people's um, other people's prompts. Um, uh, future. So you start off with the subject, a futuristic teacher in a classroom with a science lab background and um, high def full body. Hopefully I spelled everything right. And then it's gonna generate that image. Once I generated, um, once I generated an image, the image that I used was a, um, a sci-fi futuristic cyborg. Um, and I, I think I might have used steampunk. And going back into some of my designs, you, oh, here we go. So these are some of the ones that I generated on my grid. 
You can also blend photos. So I took a picture of myself and I blended it with this photo here. I just took a screenshot of, of um, this one here. So when I go back into mid journey, if I put forward slash blend instead of imagine, it's gonna allow me to um, drop two files. So the first file I dropped was the image that I created. Let's see if I can find it. Show all. Um, and then I just added my um, headshot. My headshot was one, and then I added in the other picture that I wanted to blend me with. And the result of that photo was um, this one right here. No text prompt. It was just a blend. And it gives you several different options. So you can pick like that one right there. It doesn't do me justice at all. Um, so after I did that, I went into DID. So DID allows you to upload, um, to create videos uh, with avatars. So I app smashed with DID, Murph, and MidJourney. So there's Brad. So um, let's say this is going to be my presenter. They have all kinds of stock presenters as well. So if, if you wanted to use a stock presenter that they have, you can use that. Or you can upload yourself or you can um, you can use an AI tool to like finesse your um, your photos and polish them a little. And then um, you type a script. Instead of typing a script, I uploaded my audio from Murph. Um, but you can also type a script. Hi, I'm Amanda Fox, and I'm presenting on creating AI videos for our instruction, period. And then you just hit generate video. Um, it, there are uh, credits, there is a freemium to this, so not all of your video, or sometimes it takes more credits depending on the length of the video. So here's the video I just created. Now, I took my image and I put it in Canva and gave myself a green background so I could use screen screen to isolate my avatar and any of my other presentations using Canva or whatever else. So um, going back to um, Murph and um, ways, ways to App Smash, I just kind of skipped ahead. With WordTune, if I go into, let me see, um, UDL and the class classroom. And I go up and I um, and I access my word tune. It can't well, it can't read this page. Hold on. It can't read Google searches, but it can read other other pages with longer text and it will chunk it for them. Blogs or any kind of information that students are reading. It's gonna take there's eight key points. It's some it's taken this whole blog and it's it's condensed it down to a minute. I'm gonna hit load all key. Oh, get more summaries. So there's a freemium for that as well. So um, it's zero for three, but then it's $9.99 a month after. But there are other tools that do this as well. WordTune also generates um, – it'll generate um, transcripts for YouTube videos. It'll summarize videos. So if you're looking to differentiate and, and, and provide IE, you know, meet IEP uh, – content and I like IEP requirements for students. You can take videos and provide transcripts that highlight all the key points that are bulleted pointed. And then it has a time a timestamp transcript on, on the right. So this is great, a great use case of AI to um, for differentiation. Um, Deep L 
Translate. This tool is really simple and um, it, it just allows you to translate text. Hi, I'm Amanda Fox and I'm teaching about AI. So it just translated it for me in German. And um, you can just copy and paste that into any other platforms that you need for a translation tool for students to speak a, a, a different native language. So the, the last thing I want to do is um, I want to leave you guys. So we just app smashed with um, MidJourney, DID, and um, Murph. We're going to do a Curapod interactive lesson. So Curapod is made for teachers by, it's a company based out of Norway, and um, you can generate lessons. So if I wanted to create a full lesson, you can create a blank lesson, full lesson, lesson hook, discussion questions, mini project, brain break, multiple choice, or exit ticket. I'm going to go with full lesson on um, figurative language. And we're going to do it for seventh grade because that's what I taught. You can put your learning objectives and standards in here. I'm not going to because I want to show you what it does uh, with, without any of those parameters. Um, with those parameters, it's going to customize it even even more accurately for the students that you're teaching in your classroom. So it's going to generate the lesson and it's going to be in the form of a slide deck. Now, to start off with, it's activating prior knowledge. It's, it's kind of follows that Charlotte Danielson kind of framework a little. So it, um, it has students, they, they go in and they're going to um, answer in a word cloud what is a simile? And you can change, you can, it can be a poll. You can change it to a poll and add questions. You can change the type of activity in the beginning. Maybe um, they're drawing vocabulary and they need to, they need to draw, um, draw something. Or maybe they're working out a math problem. They can, they can draw and work out their problem and, and then submit it. You can change the duration. And then participants, your students can actually vote on most creative drawing once it's done and you can change the vote duration as well. It can be like, okay, you have a minute to vote on the best and then it'll, it's gonna generate results for you. But if we go through and we look, you can actually change the background for each of these, these slides. Th these slides are a little busy for me, um, but it gives you, you know, figurative language, make writing more. Here's concepts, metaphors, and similes. What's your favorite type of figurative language? So you're not you're not starting from scratch. You're starting from something that you can build on and that you can um, mesh with other other content and um, other lessons that you've done in the past. So if I go back, I have an AI classroom webinar exit ticket. So we are going to actually, you guys are going to do this. So um, if you go to curie.live and put in the pin 35208. Um, I'm going to give you guys, I'm going to go, go ahead and give you guys a minute to, um, to join. So I'm typing it in the chat or if, if someone else can type it in the chat, Curie Live. The pin is 35208. All right, I got 11 of you. 11. You can click and see who's in. Okay.
And it basically shows a word cloud. So th this is um, these are different things that you guys have shared with what you found most useful from today's webinar. You can do this with students. Uh, I think this is a, a fun way to figure out what people know about uh, the content that you're teaching. And we are going to uh, wrap that wrap it up. So um, I'm going to add us to the stream. That All right. Fantastic. Thanks, Amanda. That was, I loved that. I, th I think you, you did like a whistle stop tour of, of some of the greatest tools out there at the moment. Um, and I think that's what we, that's what we really wanted this webinar to be, didn't we? Kind of just to go, right, look, this is how this is. AI is here. It's, let's, a lot of people are still having the conversation of, do we use it? Do we not use it? And I think, I think you did a great job there of going, look, it's here. People are using it. And these are the tools that our students are using, our, that teachers are using all over the world right now. So um, I'm really excited. I think I put in the chat before, I'm really excited for people to, to, to get a hold of the book now. Um, I know it's going to be out um, very soon in the, in the coming weeks, but um, uh, yeah, it's it's going to have all these tools, the practicalities of using them, um, the the kind of theory behind AI and how how we feel like it's going to change education and how we how we prepare for it, and then all these practical tools. So, yeah, it's really exciting. Yeah, and again, this wasn't meant to be a deep dive; it was meant to be a taste. So you have full size candy bars and you have fun size. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed our fun size uh, like taste of what AI has to offer and what is going to be in the AI classroom book. Um, there's a whole section on um, chat GPT um, and, and, and like emotional intelligence, which um, Brad, um, do you want to talk a little bit about just like touch on the, the future of work and emotional intelligence for what's next? Sure. So when we're thinking about what's happening next with AI and um, we're thinking about how this is going to impact classrooms and students and society as a whole. It's not just education. This is everywhere right now. It's changing professions as we speak. Um, what we have to worry about is what we call and Dan refers to the new digital divide. Um, we have to worry about, OK, there's those those who use AI and those who do not use AI. And what's going to be the difference in searching for jobs? How many applications you get? I mean, I just had an article Right. I think I saw an article just a few an hour ago about how somebody got way more responses when they used AI to help write their resume. So really, it's going to be who can use it and who knows how to use it and who doesn't know how to use the technology and who was not taught how to use it in school. Um, you, talk, you have a lot of people talking about I didn't learn this in school. If you don't learn this in school, uh, it's going to be something where you're going to be a disadvantage to your peers that did. Um, you're going to be a disadvantage to your, uh, you know. I don't know. I, I'm very big on the future of work skills. I'm very big on uh, making sure students are ready for the future. In addition, I want to think about also how can we use this skill, but keep our humanity. So when we think about social emotional learning, when we think about um, emotional intelligence and things like that, that's going to be key in the future of work. That's going to be key. So no matter how advanced this technology gets, what makes us human is what we need to focus on. We need to focus on emotional intelligence. Um, we need to focus on skills. We need to focus on all of these huge things and just the ease of everyone's mind. Like Dan said earlier, you still have to know how to read, write, do arithmetic, have number sense, um, understand processes. It's just that this is going to enhance those things because you're not going to know if the information you're getting is good information, bad information. Um, you know, if you, you still have to be able to think critically. It's just a matter of now we have new tools that help do some of these tasks with us instead of us having to generate some of these ideas. And and Dan, did you have something to add to that as far as the future of where we're going? Yeah, I think I think I think we're in for a ride. So sit tight and 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 I think with there's so many benefits to this. Um, I think the teaching profession and 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 education, especially here in the UK, is is kind of it's at a crux point really. Um, and 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 we need all the help we can get. And I think this will it'll first, it'll it'll optimize what we're doing already, but I think in the longer term it's gonna it's gonna revolutionize how we how we educate the, our young people and how we prepare them for the world because the world's gonna be a very different place with this technology. 
so I'm excited to to delve into it and to to go on that journey with you all. And I know there's a few people being asking, is a is there a prompt guide? There is. So if you if you've stumbled across this and you haven't subscribed, um, or if you have, yeah, if you haven't registered, if you go to teachergoals.com, you can register, um, and you can receive the prompt guide. So that's our gift to you for joining us today. And I think it's a it's a twenty page guide. I think it's twenty pages. I might have got that wrong, but um, it has a lot of information in there. Um, it has the prep model and it has um, some prompts in there. The that's different to the book that's going to be coming out very soon, and, and we're gonna we're gonna keep you updated on that. So if you have registered, we'll keep you updated on when the book will be out and when it'll be uh, available for pre order as well, so that you can get it um, as soon as you can. Because I think this is this is going to help a lot of teachers around the world, and it's great to see so many teachers around the world joining us. Um, yeah. I think that's all I've got to say. It's it's twenty past one here. Um, I'm 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 barely holding on. So someone else take over. <laughs> all right. So um, yes, I did teach in Georgia, Patricia. And um, again, the book is coming out. Um, it it should it should be out this spring. Um, the ebook is already available for pre order on Amazon. Um, the paperback will be available in the coming month or two. Um, we're excited about it. Um, if you in the meantime want to have the contents from our book put into professional development at your school, either virtually or in person, feel free to book us. And in regards to our next webinar, um, I'm going to, if you're still in that CuraPod, um, before before we leave, um, at, when, or when we close out, I'm going to put the CuraPod up again. We're going to stop the webinar, but your responses will still be coming in on topics that you want us to see us do next. Um, Brad, would you like to uh, close us out? Sure. I want to thank you all for coming. And again, as Amanda said, this is a sample. This is a big topic. There's a lot to learn. Um, but I hope that you just go and check out ChatGPT, play with it a little bit, you know, give us some prompts, use the guide that we gave you. Um, it's something that's going to help you. It's something not to be, it's something to be weary of, but something that you shouldn't avoid at all costs because this is where society is going just like with the calculator just like with the car that was a motor motorized car this is what's next in education in my opinion so um just try to embrace it the best that you can and be weary at the same time of what it can and cannot do um, we'd love to come out to your school like amanda said we'd love to do uh, more work with you and we will uh, of course update you with more progress as we go with this book coming out in the spring but for now uh, amanda how can they find you on twitter and uh, I'm at Amanda Fox STEM. It's in my uh, my name. Um, we all have, yeah. Actually, we all have our total ha Twitter handles in our in our names on the screen. So, absolutely. And and, and Dan, um, you have your Twitter up there as well. Yeah, yeah. Come, um, I, I try to put something out every couple of days, something substantial on a guide, a video guide, and in instructions on on how to use these tools to. To, to really drive impact within education. So yeah, come follow me and, and let's share some ideas together. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm at Weinstein EDU and we have a Facebook group that is growing rapidly with over 5,000 people that are discussing artificial intelligence every day. And that Facebook group is the AI classroom or just AI classroom. So if you go to you know, Facebook and just search AI classroom, you're going to find us. Um, but don't hesitate to reach out and we look forward to seeing you next time. And we'll let you know when that is. All right. And as we close out, if you guys will um, put what topic on artificial intelligence should we cover next? I'm going to go ahead and replay that. Be sure to join. And that's a wrap. We're going to go ahead and, and um, peace out. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Have a good night.